Welcome, and thank you for coming so early. Um, I know Houston traffic could be awful, um, so thank you for coming. Is this working okay? Because I really don't want to stand behind the podium. Can you guys hear me okay? All right. Uh, thank you for the cold morning as well. It's only 6.30 a.m. in California, so I really needed that wake up. I refused. I saw the weather in for as I, I am not bringing a coat to Houston, Texas. <laughs> so the best I could do is just not wear open-toed shoes from California and instead put on some form of cowboy boots to feel like that I could be here. So thank you for having me here today. Let me get my uh, PowerPoint kind of set up here. Uh, thanks for having me here today. I was really excited when I got the call to be part of this Houston speaker series. And I really think A Plus is um, one of the only organizations that I know is doing something like this for the community to get you guys to really think about what change might look like, to really think about what you want to do differently for kids and in your schools. And so I got really excited and of course I said yes and, and, and rallied for this. And then I started looking at the website to see who the other speakers were. And then I was like a little intimidated and a little daunted because I saw like Amanda Ripley, this wonderful journalist who wrote the book, and Smartest Kids, I've seen her speak. Andy Coppins, you guys saw him last week, he's a great colleague, we've worked together for years off and on. And then most of all though, I saw this guy, Sir Ken Robinson, that he's after me. And I'm like, oh no way. <laughs> this is no way that I'm like speaking before Ken Robinson. Because like, have, have you guys all seen his TED Talk? Yeah. Most of you, right? All right, well, you're part of the two million. You've <laughs> seen that, right? So I had to talk myself down. So it's okay, Monica, you've done a TED Talk. Okay, it was TEDx in the Bronx, outside of New York. Not quite the national stage. All right, Monica, it's okay. You've had 2,000 views. <laughs> But I have 2,000, maybe one day I'll catch up with Sir Ken, but I think he's a, a rock star. But you know, as the introduction said, I did at least write a book, like he has, um, and I did write a book on deeper learning, and it really is a culmination of my career and my experiences in education. And, and it really, you know, I, I, I was happy to have this opportunity that Hewlett Foundation gave me, and it really kind of is my own journey probably through my own kind of education experience and failure as a first generation student when I went to college, my first couple of years really struggling, probably in search of like what I think our kids should have, right? But also I came to this from a college access perspective. So my first job in education was right here in Texas, Texas Women's University. Um, I was the admissions counselor. I probably know the Rio Grande Valley better than most people in Texas, actually. I've been to Houston, I would go to your schools in Dallas, and I would recruit students for Texas Women's University which really kind of got me into the college access issue. But that ultimately, you know, I kept watching kids fail in college, whether I was working at Texas Women's University, Bronx Community College, or Williams College, the number one college in the United States. And so I really wanted to find out what's going on. So I started really working in K-12. And I started working around that time with the Annenberg Challenge Grant. So it dates me, but that's how I know A+, plus, is they actually, you guys had the Annenberg Challenge Grant here. And gosh, how many years ago is that? Like, 20? 20. Yeah, 20 years ago. That's how old and how long I've been working on this same problem, right? And that ultimately morphed into working in high school, first high school reform, right? And really kind of thinking about why all the kids aren't ready for college. Now high school redesign and now innovation. So it's kind of really tracked that. And so um, but then, to, to, I, I feel like I was probably in the wilderness for about eight to 10 years working on high school reform, right? So I'm gonna liken myself, since I am in Texas and I did graduate from Baylor University, the largest Baptist college in the world, I'm gonna liken myself to Moses here today, right? I'm wandering in the wilderness, I'm in the desert, I have lost faith that there is a promised land, right? And lo and behold, I'm living in Ohio, so that'd be one reason why I lost faith. And um, anybody might who lives in Ohio. And, um, and then I was, I was charged with responsibility of looking for what's innovative in the United States that our foundation could support. And I walked into a school in Sacramento, California, and bam, I was suddenly transported to the promised land. It was a high school, and, there, and, and kids there actually were enjoying school. They were happy. They were having fun. Most of all, they were engaged. They were engaged with their teachers. They were engaged with their peers. They were moving around. They were interacting with one another. They were communicating effortlessly and intellectually, and they were using technology. And the school looked like their lives. I thought, oh, this is so exciting. I finally found the promise land. I want more people to come. I want to bring more people. So fortunately for me, I worked for a foundation that was spending down their endowment at that time. 
And so I went to them and said, let's invest in this and let's spread this around the United States, right? So I became like this little itinerant education innovation minister of sort, right? So the board and the CEO supported me. We acquired the organization that was called the New Technology Foundation then and positioned it to really spread around the United States. And I think we doubled the schools within the first year, maybe tripled them, and they're doing an amazing job now. But, but that wasn't enough for me to go school by school. I mean, I thought it was great. I love New Tech. I'm still a huge fan of New Tech and, and um, run into folks all around um, the United States who are using that model. But I wanted to do more. I wanted to see more. And again, maybe I was a little bit like Moses. I was like, OK, it's happening over here, but is there really a promised land? And I needed to find out if there really was. So fortunately, thanks to the Hewlett Foundation, I was able to embark on a journey to go discover other schools that were doing this that we're really doing some kind of radical shift around teaching and learning that would really help our students in this culture and in this economy. So I went through all my different networks. Andy's one of them that you guys had here a couple months ago. Tom Vanderark, I think you guys had him. And I ultimately landed on eight schools. Eight schools from California to Maine, very different from one another, and they all served a very diverse population, either socioeconomically, ethnically, or learning style, or all of the above. And so I went to see these eight schools, and they made me a believer. And again, they confirmed there is a promised land. And so what I bring here today is their story and what they taught me about how we have to change teaching and learning. Fortunately for me, we are in a very exciting time in education. People are talking about innovation in education every day. It's probably one of the most optimistic periods I've lived in, because now you know I've been living in it for 20 years around education reform, and you can't go anywhere without hearing about people saying, let's disrupt it, let's innovate, let's ideate, you know, all these kind of things. And we hear that a lot in the business community, right? You think about Uber, what, how that's disrupted, you know, the taxi service and all of that. But what's going to disrupt education? You have businesses talking about it, but now you have federal agencies talking about it, you have states talking about it, you have communities talking about it, you have educators talking about it. And even the White House talks about it. President Obama has, has had many summits at the White House on innovation for industry and for manufacturing, and guess what? For education. I was at the White House a few months ago where he called many innovative leaders together, philanthropists and business leaders, where he had us commit to creating more innovative schools and to helping people reimagine. So one by one, major foundations around the United States got up and said what they would do. One by one, groups like New Tech Network, Expeditionary <coughs> Learning, Idea Schools that are down in the valley here, got up and said how many schools they would create, right? And so it was a really great moment. And so again, very energetic time. So you would think we would have more change at this point. You would think there'd be more innovation. You would think all of our schools are innovative by now. But they're not, are they? The small subsets are. And we don't have whole districts that we can look at that we can say are innovative. And so, you know, we think about, oh gosh, why is that? Oh yeah, it's hard, right? You guys are educators, you know how hard it is to turn the system. You know, our innate fear of change is another reason. I'm sure if I asked all of you what you think the reason is why we haven't really transformed our schools to serve our students for this culture and economy, is you might start first with the federal government, some of you might start with No Child Left Behind and its impact on testing. Some of you might blame your state system. Some of you might just blame district bureaucracies. Some of you might point at the community that they're not ready for this. Some of you might point at parents and say they're not ready for this. And some of you may even point at students and say they can't do this. So we keep looking at everybody else and coming up with lots of reasons why we are not innovative with all of our schools. But I actually think well, but I think we're, we're growing. So I, again, going back to optimism, when I was um, creating a high school coalition in the early 2000s, I would go around and I would ask these national leaders of these organizations, including the PTA, some civil rights groups, I'd say, what do you think a graduate from our K-12 system should know and do? What should they be able to do when they leave our system? And, you know, I got a lot of pauses and a lot of thinking. And at the best, I'm missing a slide, it's out of order. At the best, I got things like, well, kids should be respectful, they should have good grades, they should, you know, go to college, they, they should be able to get a job, they should have high test scores. These are the kind of definitions I would get of what we wanted our students to, to end with when they left our system. 
Worst yet, I asked my, my friends who have kids, you know, how do you know your school's good? And, and I mean, I'm still having these conversations with friends. I just like my new, like, you know, uh, happy hour question or coffee <laughs> question, right? <laughs> how do you know your kid? And they're like, oh my God, someone get her out of this room. I'm bored. I don't really want to talk about that right now. I'm here to get away from my kids. But um, so, so I ask them, and they say the same thing. Well, you know, the school has high test scores. There's good GPAs. It's a blue ribbon school. It's been, you know, named as a, as a blue ribbon school. Or they might, you know, say, um, well, I want my kid to go to college. I want my kid to get a good job. And that's it, right? Or actually, the most interesting answer is when they say that the school has a foundation to raise money for enrichment activities. These are our definitions of success right now, right? Of how we know our schools are succeeding. <coughs> and we need to change that up. And I feel like the conversation has changed. Now when I ask people, what do you want your students to know and do? I hear things like, I want my kids to solve problems. I want my kids to be critical thinkers. I want my kids to collaborate. The new popular one is, I want my kids to have a growth mindset. That might be a little California, I don't know. But I do hear it. My best answer came when I asked this teacher in Montana the question. And she, she sat there for a second, and she said, well, I, I want my kids to be tired. I thought, you got to be kidding. I kind of like let her go through her motions. And it was so cool because she wanted them to be tired because they'd be thinking so hard. And I thought, that is so great. I love her aspiration, right? And so I love that the conversation is shifting around innovation. I love the conversation is shifting. But I think what our real problem is, no matter how many fingers we want to point at as folks, is we don't have collective vision about what we want our students to know and do. We don't have a shared vision nationally, nonetheless within our states, nonetheless in your community, and probably not even at your school. And we have to start with vision. And it seems so simple, and one reason why I'm going to talk about that today is I actually don't talk about it in the book. I talk about the practices. But I have walked away from these schools knowing that it was vision that drove these schools. And if we don't take the time to create that kind of shared vision and consensus around it, we're never going to have commitment, and then we're never going to change our practices, and then we're never going to change our schools. And so to me, this is where deeper learning comes in. This is the power of deeper learning, is it can help states, districts, communities, and schools shape the vision for what they want their students to know and do. Now, personally, even though I wrote a book titled Deeper Learning, I don't care if you don't call it deeper learning. At the end of the day, all I care about is that you identify your learning outcomes for your students that's consistent with what our culture and our economy will demand of our kids. So deeper learning is a really wonderful umbrella term that I love. And it basically encompasses six competencies. You can see my little superhero kids up here, because it makes them superheroes if they have these competencies, right? It says, I'm more than average. I'm a superhero. And so at the end of the day, what I also like about these six competencies, it integrates all the other education jargon out there, right? So if you're talking about social emotional learning, if you're talking about 21st century learning, uh, workplace learning, place-based learning, college and career ready, <coughs> grit, all of those things, this encompasses them. There are six competencies here. The first one is, of course, our students have to develop a strong academic foundation, right? Nobody's going to disagree with that. But we also need them to develop and understand key concepts and principles within subjects. We <coughs> need our students to be critical thinkers and problem solvers. We need our students to be able to work in teams productively towards shared goals in a timely manner, where they're integrating and contributing <coughs> their own relevant experiences, ideas, and knowledge. We need students to be able to communicate complex concepts to a variety of audiences through multiple modes of expression, right? Verbally, orally, and visually. And then we need our students to be self-directed learners, students who know how to learn. So many of us have lifelong learners in our mission statement, what does that mean for our students to, be, to know how to learn, how to manage their time, how to identify obstacles and barriers to their success? And then we need our students to have an academic mindset. And this is particularly important in low-income communities they, and, and students who have seen or experienced failure. They have to be able to see themselves as academically successful. They have to understand that what they do now will contribute to their future, so they will engage in positive behaviors, but they will persevere as well. So these are the six competencies that I'm talking about when I say deeper learning. But again, you know, you guys can call them whatever you want. I just want you to have a vision 
for what our students should be able to know and do. Now, let's say you start with vision. Okay, well, well then what? So great, I have a vision. Well, let me tell you about some of the vision the principals had. One principal, when I asked them, so before I went to, well, before I actually settled on the eight schools, I actually called multiple schools and I would interview the principal. And I would say, tell me what your goals are for your kids. Or tell me um, what your students will be able to do better than other students in your district or in your state. So one of the principals said, you know, well, I want my students to solve problems. And he didn't just stop there. He said, I want my students to be able to articulate themselves clearly in front of multiple audiences. I want my students to work with others in teams and with people who are different than they are. I want my students to produce in the college setting and in STEM fields. And I want my students to have some understanding of the real world. And last but not least, I want my students to be resilient so when they experience failure for the first time, it won't set them back. Another principal, when I asked him what his goals were, he quickly said, I want my students to think on their feet. I want them to be able to defend their point of view with evidence. I want them to be able to give constructive feedback to others in a very authentic way. And I want them to be able to connect between subjects what they're learning. And then I love this one. He said, and I want them to have the belief and the knowledge that, what they, what, that their knowledge and skills will make the world a better place. I mean, besides the fact these guys are deeply prolific, <laughs> if not even poetic, who can argue with that vision? And so they set that vision for their school, and then they had the teachers and the community and their business partners share that vision so that everybody was on the same page. So the book does not <coughs> talk about vision setting, and that's why I talk about it here, because it's so important. So, you know, I, I probably used to not think vision was that, you know, that important, and you hear mission-driven organizations. It's true. It's so important. If we can agree on learning outcomes, then we can all work towards it. So maybe some of you have a wonderful vision at your school, and I'm sure many of you do. Then the real question becomes, do you walk the talk, right? Do you just say you want to develop these outcomes, but you don't, right? So what's it look like when you walk the talk? Well, if you want students to be able to understand and apply, or understand key concepts and principles, you better give them opportunities to apply those key concepts and principles, right? And that's what I mean about walk the talk. So how do you get students to, to understand key concepts and principles? Well, at Science Leadership Academy, the 11th graders, after they learned about the legislative process, they had to apply what they learned about the legislative process. So what they did was the teacher had this project called the Citizen Lobbying Project. And students had to identify a problem in Philadelphia. It's Philadelphia, so there's many. These kids were not short on ideas about problems in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, right? So you identify a problem, and then you research. What's the complexity to the problem? But you just don't research that by going online or using a textbook or using any kind of media. You go interview community members. You go interview stakeholder organizations that lobby and support this problem. And then what do you do? You write a policy proposal. And most importantly, you then present it to the city council. That's how you apply concepts. On, on another level, uh, in 10th grade, the students, after they study their geometric concepts, fractals in particular, and this is when like, the conversations above my head and the kids are talking to me, um, what, after they understand geometric concepts, they then have to actually design and prototype a lighted Koch snowflake. Students have to integrate their courses. So that's how you apply concepts, right? So students in chemistry, after they learn about the carbon cycle, and when they're learning about the impact of the Industrial Revolution on the economy and, on, um, and on, the, on the environment, they then have to write a legislative proposal in their English class that they actually will present to environmentalists or they'll present to policymakers. So this is how you develop the concepts and principles and how they understand. You can't say you want your students to be critical thinkers and problem solvers, but spoon feed them information and give them discrete tasks that are short in nature and end without any kind of complexity to it, right? So these students are always having to learn how to solve problems, but how to use evidence as well, right? So many of you, I'm sure, do this. I did see when I was a kid. They have you engage in a debate. But these aren't simple debates. So like at High Tech High, the students have to research tons of information that they then synthesize into a research brief in preparation for a 35-minute debate on a contemporary issue that's grounded in one of the six central topics of that history class. 
And then the killer is they don't know which side they're going to take in the debate until about 24 to 48 hours ahead of time. Another one, which is more fun, a lot of them use mock trials, right? And so the fun one at Science Leadership Academy was that 11th graders either prosecuted or defended who they thought were the perpetrators of the demise of the Aztecs. They had to use six pieces of information that they acquired when they were studying the conquest of the Aztec Empire. So they might actually be prosecuting the, the king and the queen of Spain, or they might be defending them. They might be prosecuting Cortes. They might even prosecute the indigenous allies of Cortes, or the Aztecs themselves for being irresponsible in how they went about their empire. So they're learning how to be critical thinkers, right? That's what this is all about. You can ask students to collaborate and then have them learn passively and learn primarily through direct instruction, right? So again, you can't say one thing and then not really do it. You've got to walk the talk. So instead, you have to put students in authentic, meaningful group work where they are generating new ideas, solving problems, or creating products by integrating other perspectives. So it's not just reading and just sharing and going, I like that. That was good. Yeah, can you read that other paragraph to me? That's not collaboration, right? You know, or okay guys, let's write an opinion piece based on this really quickly in five minutes. So instead, you can take sixth graders and you can use part of your, your, your time with them in math to have them as a group identify if a formula that a teacher gives them is true or false. And then they have to, as a collective, come up with whether it's true or false and present their evidence to the class, right? So there's lots of small ways or big ways that you can, that you can do this in terms of having students work together. Um, in in uh, one of the videos I usually use that we're not doing today, at King Middle School, the students have to create a wind turbine. And the only two guiding principles they have is it has to be creative and it has to generate six volts of electricity. And they work in teams to do this. And they've, of course, learned a lot about all this in their science and their math class and in this engineering class they're taking. And then they have a competition at the end to see which wind turbine actually <coughs> generates most of the electricity. So you can't tell students that you want them to communicate complex concepts and then never give them an opportunity to speak. Nonetheless, do presentations. You know, we all remember that one communications class where we had to do one speech at the end of the semester and that was pretty much it, right, at the end of the quarter. These students are constantly communicating with each other in groups. You can hear they're presenting to the city council, they're presenting to environmentalists, they're presenting to their parents, they're presenting to others. So that's the kind of action you have to get going, but you have to give them opportunities to communicate. And then most of all, you can't ask our students. This is always the, the biggest kind of contrast to me. People say, I want my students to be self-directed learning learners, and yet we put them in the most controlling and prescriptive <laughs> environment possible. Well, they don't get a single choice, not even about when they get to go to the bathroom, right? So you've got to build in choices for students, small to large, right? And then most importantly, your job as a teacher to ask why on everything they do. One student said, everything here at this school is why. So basically, if you give them choice, it can be really as extreme as one of the schools in my book called Avalon, where students actually design their own independent projects based on their interests, but aligned to standards. That's like your most extreme of tons of choice, right? And they have traditional classes in between as well. But most importantly, going back to that student's quote about everything at this school is about why, is teachers always say, well, Monica, why'd you do that? Why'd you pick that argument? Why'd you choose this presentation? Why aren't you gonna, why aren't you gonna do it this way? What facts? Where'd you get that resource? Always asking questions. And so that's where you turn your role more into a guide. And then if you want students to have a strong academic mindset, you can't focus on failure of one test, one quiz, one paper. Instead, you have to provide opportunities for students to get feedback on their work to revise their work, to understanding it's never done, and that there's no such thing as just failure one time. And you have to give students opportunities to reflect <coughs> on what they're not doing well and what they're doing well. So teachers build this in to their curriculum unit, right? But also the school as a culture can build this into rituals. So at the end of the school year, all of these schools had some kind of ritual for each grade. So at Casco Bay, Freshmen had to end the school year by presenting out to their class, their advisory, who am I, how am I doing, and what are my plans for the future. <clears throat> There's different rituals that all of them do. My, other, my favorite ritual slash strategy is student-led conferences. Do some of you do the student-led conferences here? 
So instead of having the parent-teacher conference where the parent and the teacher are at school and Monica's at home watching TV wondering what the teacher is saying to her mother or her father about her performance, guess what? The student's front and center with the parent, with the teacher at the school, and the student is leading that conversation. Now the student was prepped and supported for the conversation with the teacher, but the student's going to tell the teacher and the parent, this is what I'm doing well, this isn't where I'm doing so well. And then guess what they're going to say? And this is the kind of help I need. That's how you turn our students into self-directed learners who have a strong academic mindset. It can't be this passive talking about them in the third person or no, never giving them opportunities to reflect. So you've got to walk the talk. You can't say you want these learning outcomes and then not do it. Because once you have this vision and it's so driven into the school, it will permeate the school. And everything they, they do in the work, every decision that's made, the behaviors, the beliefs, they will follow form. These teachers could never see themselves doing anything differently. They never veer off course because they're so clear about what they want their students to know and do. And in fact, they have such an inner drive to even do it better. How can I actually develop this skill better? So that's why vision is so very important. Now, if you read my book, and I hope you will, <coughs> um, we gave out a lot yesterday, is that I've identified six specific strategies in the book, right? And so I'm not going to focus on that because, again, like I said, my book, I really didn't focus on the power of vision. But this tells you the six strategies you need to do to be able to develop these six learning outcomes. And I wasn't even that smart when I wrote the book to think six and six, but that's, that's a nice uh, even number, right? However, it's not like you do one thing for one outcome, right? If you've heard me share those projects, the students are developing these learning outcomes all the time, not kind of in isolation, right? So if you look at these six strategies, empower students, contextualize knowledge, connecting learning to real life, extending learning beyond school, customizing learning, wire learning. If I have to, if I have to like boil down those six strategies to an elevator talk, at the end of the day, what these six strategies do is it shifts the teacher's focus and the leader's focus from schooling to learning. And that's where we have to move. So when I talk about innovation, I talk about us going away from the process of schooling and moving to learning. And how do you do that? Again, if this was my elevator speech, I'd skip the six, and I'd say there's three things you do. You connect with and to kids, you connect subjects, and you connect learning to real life. So as you saw in the examples I was giving about how you develop these outcomes, these students are active. They're getting online. Most importantly, they're getting out of their school. They're going into the community. They're going into research institutions. They're going into museums like this. Some of them even have their school at museums, right? They're, they're, they're always active, but they're getting outside of the school, and that's what I mean about extend learning beyond the walls. And that is what's really important. And because of that, you have students who time after time in each school told me, I never have to ask why I'm learning something. Wouldn't you love not to have your students go, Ms. Martinez, why do I have to learn this today? Why do I have to learn fractals? Well, man, I just created a cool Koch snowflake, right? I understand now how I use geometric concepts in the design process. So students don't have to ask why anymore. So some of the other great quotes that students told me was, one student said, um, at an average school, and I like that, an average school, and, and she's at a public school in an urban in, an environment that's 100% low income students. At an average school, you just study for a test, and that's it, and you're done. At my school, you're excited to retain the information because you're always going to use it. Another student said, we are always learning here. It's never over. Another student, when I asked her what was different about her school, she said, well, I'm responsible for my learning here. I can't blame my teacher for me not learning. So see the, 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 the dynamic shift, right? Another student said, well, when I first went to high school, I thought it was just going to be any, it's just going to be about me getting a good GPA so I can go to college. And there was going to be no meaning for me at this school. But when I got to do independent projects that were related to my interests, when I got to do internships, then I had meaning to school. And then the last quote is actually a visualization that a student gave me. And I loved it because he was relatively new to one of the schools that I was visiting. And he just transferred from like the other high school in his community. And I said, what's different about this school? And he, he sat there and he thought about it for a while. And then he gave me this great visualization. So you know he's a visual learner, right? He said, well, at my other school, I'd walk in, sit down, and basically the teacher would <coughs> zip my head, pull it back, 
And for the rest of the day, they crammed as much information as they could in my head. And then at the end of the day, they zipped it back up, learning stopped, and they sent me on my way. At this school, we're always revisiting what we learn. It never stops. That theme just kept coming up, and that's what I mean about a transition from schooling to learning. And what's great about these schools is that I, again, chose deliberately very diverse schools. Is this school work, this kind of learning works for all students, right? So it worked for the student who was homeless because gang members burned down his home. And he was like literally couch surfing, as was his family. And they were separated, and he was separated from his grandmother. And they actually, the school found out he was sleeping at the school some nights. This kid ended up going to Harvard. Well, that was his backup school. He wanted to go to MIT. He got into 26 schools. And he's doing really well at Harvard. And this kid was homeless and was not engaged in school. It worked for Andrea, who was very, very working class, living in low-income housing, bored to death in school, and always getting in trouble, <coughs> talking too much. Friends thought she was showing off if she knew too much. And she went to her school, and she just felt like her passions were ignited. And she just so well, and, and the sky was the limit. She could do anything she wanted, and that school made sure she could. It works for Manny who was a Guatemalan immigrant, who was so good in math, <coughs> and so good in science school, that the principal was able to talk the university into allowing him to take higher level math and engineering courses while he was still in high school. It works for, for Holly, who had so many medical problems, she couldn't go to school every day. So she was always taking classes online, but she really wanted the community of a school. And because of the independent projects, and the fact she can kind of dictate a little bit about her time and schedule, she proliferated at her school. She's a middle class student. It worked for Justin, who's the kind of kid who's a wallflower, right? Who would just really blend right into the walls and nobody would have ever noticed him. And his teacher saw how disengaged he was. And they empowered him and got him excited about learning. And he had so many different experiences because they tapped into his passion. And it works for upper income kids, too. There's a student in Philadelphia, African American, was going to go to a private school. You know, her family had the means for that. But she chose this public school because it was focused on STEM, and she wanted to go there. <coughs> well, after her first year at Stanford, she was in the top 10% of her class. So when you focus on learning, all of our kids will succeed. I want to go ahead and show you a video so you can kind of see what this looks like. And then I'll kind of wrap up into some of the recommendations that I think we all need to move towards, and this is mostly geared towards leaders in how we transform our schools. The high quality work that is produced by students who attend expeditionary learning schools like Polaris Charter Academy help to illuminate what can happen when schools, families, and communities establish partnerships with one another. As a result of these partnerships, projects like the Peacekeepers of Chicago help to drive basic skill work and deeper learning amongst students. In 2012, seventh grade students from Polaris Charter Academy decided that they wanted to honor their local community members who serve as peacekeepers. They collaboratively wrote a book to honor the stories of local citizens working for peace. Peacekeepers of Chicago consists of biographical sketches and photographic portraits of select community members. Students worked in groups of three to write each biographical sketch. Each sketch is written as an argumentative piece and includes both qualitative and quantitative evidence that defends the claim that each person deserves the title of peacekeeper. So with the Peacekeeper Project, the project started out as a study of the Constitution and the issue that was happening at that time was Chicago was in debate on gun laws and allowing a conceal and carry law. 
And as we studied the Second Amendment, and as we were circling up uh, together as crew, turned out that students were not only interested in the gun law debate, but they were interested in the connection that guns have in the community. Uh, we are located in West Humboldt Park, and West Humboldt Park has a high crime rate um, with uh, like battery, um, robbery, and shootings in the neighborhood. And it's something that the students live every single day. So our conversation started shifting from the gun debate to the role that guns play in our everyday lives. And so that is when the Peacekeeper Project was born. We're trying to, um, as part of our mission statement, create um, lifelong learners who are gonna grow to become active citizens in their community. As students were working on the Peacekeepers of Chicago booklet, they made the decision to turn their topic of study into a call to action. In addition to the booklet, they organized and promoted a citywide day of peace. Furthermore, they worked in collaboration with public high school students to film and edit a series of public service announcements to advertise the citywide day of peace event. lost their lives just blocks away from our school. One of those dots could be my father. One of those dots could be my little sister. One of those dots could be me. I think this is the amazing thing about learning expeditions is that uh, when you engage students in work that means something to them, then the idea of perseverance and that and that grit that we're all talking about um, is inherent. It, they they want it. When we started our peacekeeper project, we thought we were going to change our city, but what we really did was change ourselves. Help us create a space where students, teachers, and community members can spread the word inspire one another, and support the hard work of creating change. Please join us and be the people. Thank you. So I, I love this project because you hear the different deeper learning outcomes that they've identified. And you see the collaboration. You see students making choice. You see the project evolve over time with the student's input. So you saw how it turned into a study on the Constitution, <coughs> was morphed into talking about conceal and carry, and then ultimately went to our community and homicides and our problem. You saw them working in groups. You saw them using multiple modes of communication. You saw them having to use evidence. You saw they had to write. They had to research. So that's the kind of learning shift that I'm talking about when you think about your learning outcomes. So we're going to transition a little bit into um, some, some recommendations, and I'll end with just a, a, a small, short passage I'll read from my book, and then I think we're going to have Q&A after that. So the first recommendation is not going to surprise you all. It, be a catalyst and a convener, right? And, that's, and, and you have to kind of be that change agent by starting with vision. So if you're a community leader, get your community together. If you're a parent, get the parents together. If you're a teacher, talk to your teachers and get the principal on board. If you're a principal, this is your job, you know? <laughs> but don't just work in the school, work with your community and your partners to make sure that everyone has this shared and collective vision so that everybody's moving in the same direction and nobody can go off course. <coughs> what I, this is the thing I see the hardest for schools and one reason why I showed you guys a video is you've got to be able to see it, right? I've got to touch it, I've got to feel it, I've got to hear it. I don't know what it looks like. And so you need to go visit other schools, take parents, and take community members with you, or take your school board with you, or take a business partner with you, but go see what it looks like and then have a conversation about what that school is trying to do and if you think the, the practices and the choices they've made is, are helping them get to that. And then most of all, provide time for teachers to work together. So the biggest 
way that I saw these schools were able to create the change and then sustain the change is that teachers worked in a professional school learning community environment, right, in general. It was a growing school, everybody was considered learners, but they had sustained time, anywhere from 60 minutes, 40 minutes, to two hours, to work together. To do what? To create cross-disciplinary projects. To talk about student work, and there was, whether it was meeting expectations. To talk about maybe some projects they want to do the next year. Or to spend time looking at standards and making sure those standards are reflected in the learning targets and the projects that they're doing. But teachers have to have time for this change to happen. Sometimes the time might use, be used for professional development, teacher-directed professional development, either during that planning time together or sometimes during early release days. But professional-directed, identified professional learning. Host an open house at your school for businesses or the larger community. As educators, we've decided the school of education is our purview and nobody else's. And we've kept the doors shut, and we haven't let others in. And yet, we have a wealth of people who can help us if you just tap into it. We're always looking at partners as, can you help us with funding? Can you maybe mentor? Can you maybe tutor? But what are some other ways for us to engage people in the community? Maybe they can become an expert on a panel. Maybe they can just be a guest lecturer. Maybe they have an idea of how they think they can do a project in your school. But you need to make sure they know that they're welcomed in the school. And again, walk the talk. We're not just saying we want partners. We want to find a way to engage you. One of the stories I tell is when I was running New Tech, there was a, a business partner that supported the school and, and in terms of paying for all of our services to do the professional development and the capacity building to implement this model. And, and, the, and the business funded that because he wanted students doing real work, right? And, and they wanted, the business wanted to be involved with the school as a way of providing those real experiences. The school never let them in. Gladly took their 400000 <laughs> but couldn't figure out how to let business in and help them have, create real experiences for students. So another way to think about how you can extend learning outside the school is do some kind of asset map of opportunities in your community to extend learning beyond the classroom. So what's really amazing about these schools is the teachers see their role as networker. If I want my students to learn this, what kind of experience do I need to make sure they have? And so they need to know what's available to them in the community. Now, a lot of us depend on the director of partnerships to do that for us as educators. Mm -hmm. However, these teachers did that for themselves because nobody knows their curriculum better than they do. Nobody knows their learning targets and the standards better than they do. So how can you make sure they understand what's available to them so they can connect their curriculum to other people in the community? And then last but not least, you guys have probably heard of the Super School XQ project. Uh, they're running a competition. Five million dollars goes to five winners to create a new school. They've extended the competition until February 11th, so it's not too late to still apply. Um, at the same time, if you don't want to apply because it's a lot of work, then you can go to their website and you can put in your zip code and all of that and it will list you as a resource in your community for schools that are actually applying to, um, to, to XQ. So I like listed that in my community. I live right outside of San Francisco. And I had a teacher call me and say, can you help us? I was like, sure, you know, I don't mind. And so again, these teachers are empowered, right? And so they were creating a school, and they wanted me to give them some feedback. And they're part of FXQ. And then my book is meant to inspire, but there's a flaw in that. People kind of want to know how to do it, right? <laughs> so they're like, all right, I'm jazzed. I'm ready to go. Now what? And they're like, this book is not going to be any help. So um, Hewlett Foundation was very gracious and funded me then to use what I learned from the book to turn it into a planning guide. So the, the planning guide is free, you can download it at that website, and it starts with what? Vision. <laughs> What's your vision for students? And then it takes you through a change management process so you can actually implement some of these ideas in your school. So I'm going to end the day with just a quick passage from my book, and appreciate you guys being so patient. Um, so it starts with this. In Philip, I think that was like maybe when I was in school, I was wearing those bell bottoms. I picked this picture purpose, purposely, and you'll see why. In Philip W. Jackson's classic 1968 study of daily life in the classrooms, see 1968, it's trying to capture that. Jackson wrote that students spend as much as 50% of their time waiting for something to happen. 
They wait for teachers to pass out papers. They wait for slower students to get their questions answered. They wait for the lunch bell to ring. Jackson first published this book almost 50 years ago, and yet millions of American students are still waiting. They're waiting for all of the old reasons and one relatively new one. They're waiting for our education system to catch up with their lives. Houston's students are waiting for you all. And I challenge you all today to catch up with their lives and take any of these action steps that I've given you today and implement them in your school, your community, and your district. Thanks for having me as part of your speaker series.